In those three days, we often don't stop to think about what went on. Where was he? And that's what we talked about last week. The Bible tells us that, that he ended up in hell is where he was at. And, and so he went down there. Peter tells us that he preached to the spirits there. But he, he descended down into hell for a very specific reason. Because, and this is what we looked at last week, all the Old Testament saints that were saved, all those that, that were saved of the Old Testament, they were saved, and I want to make this very clear, they were not saved by keeping the law. Uh, there's a lot of people that think that people in the Old Testament were saved by keeping the law. The law was never given as a means of salvation. Never. The law was given to help us to see how sinful we are. It was, it's our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. So anyhow, the Old Testament saints, they sacrificed bulls and goats and lambs and doves and all kinds of animals. And... When what they were doing, when they sacrificed those, they were in their mind, basically, they were looking ahead to an ultimate sacrifice that would come. So those in the Old Testament, if I could put it this way, I'll put them over here, they looked ahead to the cross. You and I look back to the cross. And they were saved by living in anticipation of the coming Messiah. They believed what God's Word said that he was going to send a Savior. So the Old Testament people were saved by looking ahead toward the cross. But now let me get you back to those animals. The animals they sacrificed could never take away sins. The book of Hebrews tells us that the blood of bulls and goats can never take away sin. So when they died, the sin was still on their account. They were saved on credit. So there was no way that they could get into the presence of God because all that sin was still on their account. They were still captive to their sin. They were forgiven, and, and they, were in, they were down in hell. Remember, hell was divided, if you want to call it Hades. But part of it was what was known as Abraham's bosom, and the other part was the place of torment. We went back to Luke 16, and we looked at that, and there was a, there was a huge gulf in the, in, in the middle where they could not go from one side to the other. So they all, they, all the saints were in Abraham's bosom or paradise, whatever you want to call it, because they couldn't go in the presence of God because the blood of bulls and goats couldn't take away their sin. So when Jesus Christ died, now listen, his death not only paid for our sins and took away our sins, but his death also took away and paid for the sins of the Old Testament saints. So he descended down into the depths of, of, uh, of Hades, and he, it says he led captivity captive, and it says he gave gifts unto men. The gifts are the spoils of the victory. And so, so that's, what, that's how we got our gifts, because of the, the sacrifice that Christ made upon the cross. And we ended last week, and I told you that it's so important that we understand that, because in order for us to be gifted, Jesus had to die. And so we should not take our gifts lightly. We shouldn't, and some people do, and we should not take our gifts lightly. Now we come on. Now we move on. And as we move on, we come to uh, a call for unity. This is part four. Still, the focus is still on unity. Okay, but in the midst of this, in verses 11 through 16, there is a wonderful blueprint for the church. If you ever wondered how the church is to function, how it's to operate today, what's it supposed to be? Is it supposed to be programs? Is it supposed to be entertainment? What is it supposed to be? This lays it out right here. And I'll say this. What we're going to look at today wouldn't be very popular in some churches today because I'm not going to pull any punches. I'm going to give it to you straight up. This is, what, this is the way the church is to function. This is the blueprint that God laid out for the church. So watch, if you would, verse 11. Watch what it says. It says, He gave some, some churches, okay, some local bodies. He gave some apostles, some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, okay? So let me break those down. We've already talked about them. First of all, there was the apostles. That gift no longer exists today. It doesn't exist. There are no apostles today. They were foundational men. You remember we looked at that. I got you too far ahead. The, the, the apostles and the prophets, let me just combine them for, for a moment. Neither one of those exists today. They don't exist. They, 
It was foundational, guys. Here we looked at it in Ephesians 2. I'll just refresh your memory in 19 and 20. Now, therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints of the household of God and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So, the apostles and the prophets, they were foundational men. They laid the foundation. They, they, uh, they were people that God used to build the foundation. Once the foundation is done, you don't need foundational men anymore. There's no longer a need for that. And so, therefore, they don't exist anymore. Now, I'm going to give you another reason why the apostles don't exist. And I could give you a reason why the prophets don't. And if I think about it, I'll do that as we go through. But I'm focusing on the apostles. They don't exist because one of the requirements to be an apostle was that that individual had to be an eyewitness of the resurrected Christ. Had to be. They had to have seen Jesus with their eyes after the resurrection. I'm going to take you to the book of Acts here in chapter 1 in a moment. And I'm going to show you that after Judas died, after he hanged himself and, and he died, there was a need to replace him. And so <clears throat> they're looking to replace him. And here's what we read in Acts 1, 21 and 22. Wherefore, <clears throat> these men, which have company with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John unto that same time that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained. They're looking to fill the position. They're going to get Matthias. That's who they're going to get. But watch what it says. To be a witness with us of his resurrection. That was a, that was a requirement for the apostles. And there are, no, there are no people around today that are witnesses, eyewitnesses of the resurrected Christ. There are none. There are none. Uh, so, those individuals no longer exist today, neither do the prophets. I'll get to them in a moment, because we have the completed Bible. You see, the apostles and the prophets, and we've talked about this, so I don't want to go too far into it, they played vital roles in the early church, because whenever the church began in the book of Acts, on the day of Pentecost, what you had was you had a New Testament church without a New Testament Bible, so they needed truth to be able to... Uh, to be able to follow. So in Acts chapter 2, we read this, and they continued the church, those that were saved, continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. So they needed to, to have a truth. They needed to have a truth to follow. And so God worked with the apostles, the teaching of the apostles. That brings the prophets in, too, because the prophets spoke a direct revelation from God given to the church. And, and I told you, we often think of the, or the prophets as somebody that talks about a future event. And that's, that's one of the applications, like the Apostle John that wrote Revelation. But at the same time, in the, church, the early church, if there was a question about family, if there was a question about uh, marriage, uh, uh, whatever, God would give a direct revelation to the prophets, and they would speak to that situation right there. And then the apostles, they taught that. And so um, they were vitally important in the early church. But now we have the completed Bible, and there's no longer a need for those guys. The foundation has been laid. But watch, God did something else. And we've talked about this, verse 43. It says, And fear came upon every soul, and many... Wonders and signs were done by the apostles. The apostles had, had what was what were known as apostolic gifts. They do not exist anymore because there's no longer a need for them. But what they did, these guys could do wonders and signs. And let, let me show you something else, and then I'll tell you what this is all about. Uh, Hebrews two, three, and four. The writer of Hebrews said, "How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation?" which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us, watch this, by them that heard him. That would be the apostles, by them that heard, heard him. It was confirmed to everybody by them. God also bearing them, the apostles' witnesses, watch this, both with signs and wonders and with divers' miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. So what you had was, in the early church, you had the apostles and you had the prophets, 
and there was a there needed to be you, there had to be a way to be able to distinguish between a false apostle and a true apostle. Because Satan, when the church started, you, we can read through Corinthians, there were there were many false apostles that tried to lead the church astray. And so there had to be a way to distinguish between a, a true apostle and a false apostle. So what God did was he gave these apostolic gifts to his apostles, just like it says here, God out verse four, God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders and with divers and miracles. He gave them these apostolic gifts so that the church would know who was the true apostle and who was a false apostle. And so, getting back to this, they were given to the early church. We don't have apostles today. The next one's prophets. We don't have prophets today either. Those individuals were the spokesmen for God. They spoke the direct revelation that God gave to them to give to the church, as I said. Some people want to take the word uh, prophets, and they want to make that teacher and say that what a prophet was was anybody that stood up in front of the church and delivered the truth of God's Word. And, and so that would make me a prophet, and I'm not a prophet. I'm a teacher. And the difference was that the prophet got his message directly from God. His message was infallible. There was no error in it at all. There can be error in my message. I don't get my message directly from God. I get it from God's Word as I diligently study God's Word. And so, therefore, there, there, are no, there are no prophets today because they gave direct revelation. Now that the Scriptures are completed, there's no longer a need for those guys. The, the third one in that verse, he gave some apostles, some prophets, and some evangelists. Now, these were men who traveled the countryside. They traveled the countryside and they shared the gospel of Jesus Christ. They went out to share the gospel outside the the walls of the church to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, let me say this. Not all of us have the gift of, of evangelists, but we are all supposed to function as evangelists. We're all supposed to. In Mark 16, 14 and 15, it says this, Jesus speaking to his disciples, Afterward, he appeared, a, he, he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So we're all commanded to do that. That's our responsibility. And just because somebody's a minister does not mean that they have the gift of evangelism. Second Timothy 4, 5 Paul said this to Timothy, he said, But watch thou in all things endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist. So apparently Timothy did not have the gift of evangelism. He didn't have that. And so Paul said, Look, you, you may not have the gift, I'm paraphrasing, but he said, You still need to do the work of an evangelist. You need to, whenever you're out in a community, you need to be sharing the truth of God's word. So so you had the apostles, you had the prophets. You're the evangelists. They exist today. They're evangelists today. They travel around. They share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And some people have the gift, though, like those who travel around. And some people don't. But that doesn't mean that if we don't, that we don't share the gospel. We're commanded to share the gospel. And then the last one that he mentions here is pastors and teachers, which is all one. That's pastor, teacher. And that was an office with two ministries. It's exactly what that was, and so the word pastor means shepherd, and teacher means somebody that communicates the truth of God's Word. So those are, okay, it's interesting here that he focuses on the gifted men that were given to the church, and, and just in those that are involved in the communication of the truth of God's Word, you catch that, you got your apostles, and you got the prophets, and you got the evangelists, and you got the pastors, and the pastor teachers. So he's focused here on those that their responsibility, their gifts are to deliver the word of God to the to the church, to the body of Christ, the, the local assembly, wherever they serve. Now, whenever you come to verse twelve, now watch this. Now he's going to tell us what's the reason? Why are these gifted men in the church? Okay, and prophets don't exist, and apostles don't exist, but evangelists and pastors teachers do. So here's what it's for, verse 12. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. 
I have those, and if just to break them down for the perfecting of the saints, and I'll get to that in a moment, and uh, for the work of the ministry and uh, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So let me let me break that down just for a moment. My responsibility to you is not to entertain you and not to teach you something that makes you feel good. That's not my responsibility. My responsibility is to teach you God's Word, which will, I'll show you this in a moment, will bring you on towards maturity. And then what it will do, for the, it will equip you for the work of the ministry. In other words, not just here, but outside the walls of this building. And ultimately, the end result is it edifies the body of Christ. But, but I want to get back to, you, to, to my responsibility, to the pastor teacher, to the pastor's responsibility. Because there's a lot of confusion about this. And so we're, we'll get it squared away today. My responsibility to you is to teach you the entire counsel of God. That's my responsibility. Let me show you something. Let me take you through a couple of verses. Acts 20, 27 through 30. Paul said this. He's talking, it's interesting. He's talking to the elders of this church who this letter is written to. To the elders at Ephesus. He said, For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. There you go. That was his responsibility. That's the pastor's responsibility. To teach you the entire counsel of God. To work through the Word of God so that you understand what God's Word says and then let the Spirit of God take it and apply it to your life. That's my responsibility. Go watch me go on. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. Here we go. Watch this. To feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. That again, the pastor's responsibility is to make sure that the church of God is fed with the Word of God. And I want to say something, and, and I say this in a kind way, and, and also in a very truthful way, because you need to understand this. That's not through preaching a salvation message every single Sunday. That's not what that's not what it's about. What that ends up doing is that this that leaves us with shallow sheep. You need to know the details of God's word, just like chapters one through three of Ephesians. You need to know this is what God says about you. This is who you are. What you got to understand is this: this the church God ordained the church as a barracks to train people, His people for the military battle that exists out there. And so when when we gather here, my responsibility is to teach to you the Word of God. And I believe, as we do, I believe it's in an expository way so that we go from the beginning of the book to the end of the book so that you understand the context of that book and what's being said in the context. I believe that that's the way God intended it. Let me show you what Jesus said to Peter after the resurrection. John 21, 15 through 17. So when they had died, Jesus said unto Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Lord, yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, feed my lambs. He says unto him again the second time, Simon, son of Joseph, lovest thou me? And he says unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He says unto him, Feed my sheep. He says unto him the third time, Simon, son of Joseph, jo Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus says unto him, Feed my sheep. Why did he say that three times? Why did he repeat that? Because that was the biggest responsibility entrusted to Peter as a pastor. To teach the Word of God. To feed the sheep and the lambs, the young ones, you know, the, the ones that are moving on to spiritual maturity. That was his responsibility. That's the pastor's responsibility. To communicate the truth of God's Word 
so that you can understand it in your life. And then as you're out doing whatever you do through the week, and you think back and you meditate on it, you may, you might think of something, or maybe not through the week, maybe today you think about something, and it comes to your mind, and you say, well, this I see how this applies here in my life. Because the Spirit of God takes it, and He uses it in your life. And three things happen, as I said. One, it brings you along in spiritual maturity. If you don't get the truth of God's Word, neither are you going to grow. You're not going to grow. You're going to remain a babe in Christ. You remember uh, uh, in the book of Hebrews, there's a couple places in God's Word, but the, the writer of Hebrews said to them, at this time, and I'm paraphrasing, you ought to be teachers. But they hadn't progressed on. They hadn't grown any. He said, I want to feed you meat, but I can only give you milk. Listen, it's my job to, pre to present to you milk and meat. And as we progress on and as we grow, that we ought to be feeding upon the meat of God's Word, not the basics anymore. Not that we don't go back and we don't review the basics, the foundational truths. We do, and we touch on those frequently. But... The, the, the point is that we better be coming along. We better be growing in spiritual maturity. Uh, just the other day, I thought about something in my own life. If I could just say this to you, that way you understand that, that you aren't the only one that goes through this. Or back a couple of weeks ago, it, to me, it felt like it was just kind of stale. You know, did we get that place where you're just kind of stale and, and, and stagnant and like, you know, I'm, I'm still teaching, and I don't want to just go through the motions. I don't want to do that. I want to communicate the truth to you. And and then we came to, uh, we were walking with Moses and coming out of Egypt, and I'm reminded that going through the wilderness, sometimes even in our own lives, we go through the wilderness, and we don't see much growth. We don't see a lot. It's like you get that place in your life, and it's, it's like you're stale, kind of, and uh, those are seasons that the Lord takes us through. In those times, we continue to press on. I remember back a couple weeks ago, whenever I was walking, just like that, I came out of that. I was walking early one morning, and all at once it hit me. It just snapped, just like that, and I was out of that. And I thought, you know what? what I'm doing what I'm supposed to do, and I need to just continue to do what I'm doing. And that is to teach you the Word of God, and so that it brings us all along in spiritual maturity. And I say all, because I've said this before, and I'll say it again. That I have to be growing, and if I'm not growing, then you're not going to grow. And uh, and and I was taught years ago that I, as a, a a leader of a church, can never teach his people to reach a level higher than what he himself has reached. And so, if I'm not always growing, neither are you going to be growing. So, so I get into the meat of God's word, and I sit and through the week, and I study the word of God, and and I you want it, and I put it together, and I bring it back to you, and that brings you along to spiritual maturity. It also does this. It equips you to serve outside the walls of this building. It, it, it equips you. It prepares you for life, basically, is what it does. I'll get into that a little bit more here. And ultimately, it edifies or builds up the body of, Je body of Jesus Christ. It builds up the body of Christ so we get stronger. Now, I, I wanted to do something that we've talked about here in, uh, in our study of the life of Moses that I think is very important. If you weren't here, you missed it, and I think you need to understand it. There's something that happens in churches today. And one of the reasons why this does not take place is because what happens, the world comes into the church. The world comes in. Unsaved people come in. And they join up. Not that there's anything wrong with fighting and inviting somebody that's not saved in. There's nothing wrong with that. But, but the bottom line is we've got to be very, very careful. Let me give you an example. When Israel left Egypt and they, 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 they came out of Egypt, they had a group that, is, that attached themselves to them. The Bible calls them the mixed multitude. They were Egyptians is what they were. They uh, they didn't follow along with Israel because they wanted to know about Israel's God. They went along with Israel for multiple reasons. Some of them, probably, they said, you know what, the economy's shot here. 
after the ten plagues in Egypt, and so what's the sense in us staying here? The government's fallen apart, and and so everything's falling apart. Let's go see what Canaan's like. Let's travel along with these people and go see what Canaan's like. Or or maybe they were the kind of people that whichever way the wind blew, they just went with the wind. And that day, the wind just happened to be blowing towards Canaan, and so they said, you know what? We're going to sign up. We're going. We're going to go with Israel to Canaan. And so they, they joined up, you know, and so they had no desire to learn about God whatsoever. They just joined up. So Israel took with them this, this mixed multitude. Well, it wasn't very long into their journey when God's feeding them manna. And in Numbers 11, we read this. Let me show you what happened. And the mixed multitude, there it is. Just keep that in your mind was among them that fell a lusting. And the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? We remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our soul is dried away. There's nothing at all beside this manna before our eyes. The mixed multitude said, We don't want this manna. We don't want it. And so they began to complain. And then what happened was, then Israel, they also got involved, and they wept, and, and they said, yeah, we don't want this. We want flesh to eat. And they got flesh. They got quail. And I mean, they got far more than what they ever bargained for. But anyhow, the mixed multitude of verse 5 says, you know what? We remember what it used to be like. And so we want to, we, boy, we long to go back to Egypt. We long to go back to where we were. And we can partake of what Egypt had to offer. Let me, now, let me make the application. Manna is a type of the Word of God. It's a type of the Word of God. So the picture here for the church today is this. The, the pastor gets up and, and he starts to feed the people a steady diet of God's Word. Week after week, service after service, he feeds a steady diet. <clears throat> Then the mixed multitudes in, and they begin to say, you know what? We don't want this. We're just about fed up with this. How about a little bit of entertainment? How about a little bit of what the world has to offer? This is getting pretty dry. We don't want this anymore. And then the next thing you know, then God's people start to say, yeah, we got, let's change up our music. Let's, let's get into a little bit of entertainment. Let's get some more programs started. Let's do this. Let's do that. And the next thing you know, they're complaining because there's nothing but manna or the Word of God being taught. And so what happens in a lot of places is that the pastor kind of bends with that and he don't want to lose anybody. And so he don't plant his feet firm and he doesn't take a stand. And so therefore, he rolls it back and it becomes a place of entertainment. <clears throat> I've told you the story many times of going before God called me to Claysburg Bible Church. We went to a lot of different places. Um, I filled in. That's what I did. I just, we traveled around on the weekends, and it was fun. It was a lot of fun. I could go in and beat the hornet's nest and then leave. I didn't have to deal with the buzz and bees. Uh, but uh, I could go in and preach the truth and then back back out, and that was, that was a lot of fun. But one place, I don't know why that's happening. I that right with that. It's my batteries. It is my batteries. I don't know. Uh, but one place we went, they got invited for a special service, and they sang, and they sang, and then they sang some more. And then we stood up, and we sang again, and we sat down, and we sang some more. And I thought, wow. You know? And whenever it was my time to go up on stage, and the pastor was coming off, and I said, how much time I got? And I had notes like I got this morning. And he said, he looked, he looked at his watch, he said, you get about 12 to 15 minutes. Well, it didn't, it didn't end up in that length of time. But anyhow, that's what, I say that to say this, that's what they were used to. That's what they were used to. They were used to being entertained and feeling good and not getting the meat of God's work. And so that's the responsibility of the pastor to teach the, the meat of God's word. Watch how long it continues. Watch verse 13. Let me keep moving on here. Watch this. 
do we all come to you? Okay, that's telling you how long. Do we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God? I know a perfect man under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Let me say this, that the, the destination for the church, the number one goal for the church is spiritual growth. Some people may, uh, they may object to that, but I'm telling you, that's what the Bible teaches us, and that this is God's blueprint right here. That we are to, we are to sit underneath the teaching of God's Word until we see there's four results here that come from the teaching of God's Word. And I'm, somehow I, I missed something, and I missed the Timothy verses, or else I've got them in the wrong order. Uh, I don't know, but I'm going to go on here. And I missed, I, I didn't get it. Never mind. Never mind. Uh, but there, was, there were four things here. There was unity. There's unity. There's a deeper knowledge. There's maturity. And then the manifestation of Christ in our lives. What's verse 13 again? Let me read it. So we all come in a unity of the faith. See what the Word of God does? It, it produces unity. You take away, you take the, the Word of God as the, as, the, as the main object from the pulpit. You take it away. And then what you end up with is division and strife and contention within the church. So it, it, uh, it produces unity. And number two, it produces a deeper knowledge. Watch this. So we all come in a unity of the faith. And of the knowledge of the Son of God, that's not a knowledge of salvation, not knowing Him for salvation, but that is a deeper knowledge, a deeper walk with Him. The next one is maturity. Watch this. We all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man. So there's that, that maturity. And then the manifestation of Christ in our lives, and that's the ultimate goal. Watch this. Unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So that's exactly uh, why the Word of God is to be taught. It produces the unity, the knowledge, the maturity, and then ultimately, this is what God wants, the manifestation of Christ in our lives. Listen, I, I came across a statement by J. Vernon McGee. He made a statement on his radio broadcast, and J. Vernon McGee was often uh, very right to the point, and you know what I mean. And listen to what he said, and I quote, I'm going to talk to you very frankly. Don't expect your pastor to do it all. He's there to train you that you might do the work of the ministry and that the church might become mature. We're not to act like a bunch of nitwits today. We are to give a good, clear-cut, intelligent witness to the world. I think the greatest sin in the local church today is the ignorance of the man sitting in the pew. He doesn't know the Word of God, and that is a tragedy. I would hate to get onto an airplane if a pilot didn't know any more about flying than the average church member knows about Christianity and the Word of God. The plane wouldn't make it. I think it would crash before it got 10 feet into the air. That is the condition of the church today. All believers need to be trained in the Word of God so that they can do the work of the ministry, unquote. That's what we're supposed to do. And so, so and that only happens, you're only going to get trained as you study the Word of God. Now watch verse 14. Here's what else it does. Watch this. Then we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried out with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Now, here's what you've got to understand. When our, when our minds are saturated with the truth of God's Word, it gets our feet planted upon the rock. And like I said, in my prayer this morning, that a lot of people were like a ship on the ocean with no anchor and the sails up. In whatever way the wind blows, that is the direction that they go. Now, what you and I need to do is, need to know is this: that Satan is doing everything he can to lead God's people astray. Give you something to think about. Before Jesus came the first time, if you read through the Gospels. There was a tremendous amount of demonic influence. A tremendous amount. Jesus cast a lot of demons out of people. That was right before Jesus came the first time. Today in our day, we're seeing, I believe, a lot of demonic activity. Whether that means that we're ever closer to the return of Christ, I don't know. But I can assure you this, that demonic activity is increasing in our world today. In deception is increasing. Watch what Paul said to Timothy. 2 Timothy 3, 13-17, it says, But evil men and seducers 
shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. That from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Watch this, that the man of God may be perfect, mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Listen, there are a lot of people out there that would love nothing more than to sow seeds of deception. And I think this, that as we progress, as our world progresses closer to the kingdom of the Antichrist, that what we are going to see is we are going to see far more deception. We'll show you what Jesus said in Matthew 24, 11. Now, this is in our day. This is in the tribulation period. He says, And many false, many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many. And so what we are seeing today is we are seeing the increase of that. We're seeing the increase of that. So that, that says, that tells me that we need to be rooted and grounded in the Word of God so that we aren't, we aren't uh, tossed about and carried about, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of man so that, so that we're rock solid. And I'll say this, too. One of the things that the enemy uses against the church is fear to get us to be afraid, to get us to be terrified. Because when we're terrified, when fear enters in, you you do uh, multiple things can happen. Number one, it'll freeze you up so that you will not do anything. You won't do anything. It'll just it, you'll, you'll just stop what you're doing, and, and 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 it'll freeze you up. Number two, what it'll do is this: it'll cause you to not trust in the Word of God. And so, whenever a wave of fear blows across the nation, if you're not rooted in the Word of God, then you're going to be swept away with that wave of fear. That's exactly what happens. And so, in order to fight against that, it takes it takes us being saturated with the Word of God, being rooted in the Word of God, so that whenever those waves of fear come that the enemy sows, that we will be able to keep our feet planted firm and say, you know what, I'm going to trust in the Word of God in the midst of this situation. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to be swayed about with, with this wave of fear that comes by. But I'm telling you this, that as time goes on, it's not going to get better. It's going to progressively get worse, and there's going to be more and more deception. You, you agree with this, that in the world in which we live in today, I've heard this said many times, and I've said it myself, who knows what to believe? With all the reports that are out there and everything that's going on, who knows what to believe? I, I'll say this. I know one thing that we can believe, and it's God's Word. We can plant our feet on God's Word, and we can know that that's the absolute truth, and it never changes. What comes through the TV set or over the radio or from wherever, the newspapers or whatever, that'll change. This will never change. And I'd say this, that as time goes on, and we've talked about this before, the church in the United States of America has never been tested. We've never been tested. Like in other lands, where people are, are executed for their faith in Christ, where their arms are cut off and their legs are cut off, where they're separated from their families, where the terrorists lie in wait to ambush him going to or from church. We've never experienced anything like that. We've never went through it. We've had it easy. And what it's done is it's softened the church. It's softened the church. And so, so then as time goes along and things begin to get a little bit more difficult, we begin to wonder, where's God at in the midst of this? Why is this happening? Or we say this, that surely... The rapture is going to occur tomorrow because of what's going on, and that could be the case. But at the same time, and we've talked about this too, that we could go a long time. And, and I told you that if we go back to the book of Daniel, in the book of Daniel we're told that the Antichrist rises out of that fourth world kingdom. 
that David said is terrible. It's got iron teeth. It smashes the residue. That kingdom exists before the Antichrist comes. So that leaves us with two two alternatives there. Either that kingdom's going to develop in our day, or it's going to develop right after the rapture. And what we're seeing today, I believe, clearly, that we're seeing the development of that kingdom, at least the push for that kingdom, was the push for globalism and everything else and the control of people. It's all about that. And so all of that said to say this, that, that you and I, as we go through life, that our faith is going to be tested. It's going to be tested. I often think, you know, one of my, some of my favorite reading is back in Peter. And I, I often wonder and think about what those poor believers went through under Nero. When they got blamed for that fire that burned Rome, it's believed that Nero set the fire. And he was about to get caught. And so he needed a way to, to pass off the blame. And so the Christians, they were already hated because uh, they were seen as family dividers. Because a lot of, uh, apparently a lot of women had come to know Christ the Savior, and the men were not very happy about that. And so they were already hated. And so whenever Nero turned and he said, well, I didn't set the fire, the church did, the Christians did. Then the persecution came. And they were broiled, they were racked, they were uh, they were hanged, they were stoned, they were they were thrown into the arena with wild animals, and crucified and set on fire alive. I often thought of this. What if that came here? What if that came here? How many people, how many of us would be left within the church that came into the United States of America started to sweep across the land? People say, well, that would never happen here. Really? Again, I'll tell you, we're one election away. If you think that's not the case, you just go to Exodus 1 and you just look at what happened. When, when a change of power happened and one Pharaoh came that knew not Joseph, one change of power and then the slavery and the bondage and the killing of the, the baby boys. So many things. The making of the bricks, just whipping, beating and abusing the Israelites. One change of power. I say, I hope it doesn't come. But it may, because what it will do, it will separate the wheat from the tares. It's easy to say I'm a follower of Christ. It's another thing whenever it's going to cost you your life or go beyond that. It's one thing if it costs me my life. It's another thing if it's going to cost me the life of my wife or one of my kids. If they say, you deny your faith, will we kill your wife? You deny your faith, will we kill your kids? Then what happens? That goes back to this. If you're not rooted deep into this, I can't imagine facing something like that. I can't imagine facing that. If I didn't have the Word of God to stand upon it, to be my anchor in the middle of that, I can't imagine that. All that said to say, we don't know what the future holds. We don't know. But I know this, that there's a lot of deception in our world today. And there's, there's a growing hatred for conservative people, fundamental Christians. There's a growing hatred. And that's not going to get better because people that get saved in the tribulation period are going to be martyred for their faith. So, and, and the kingdom that's to come is the kingdom of the Antichrist. That's anti-God. That means that anything that has to do with God is going to be hated. So, back to this. That's why we need to be rooted in the Word of God, taught the Word of God. Watch, uh, watch verses 15 and 16. Watch this. Here comes the ultimate goal. But, instead of being carried about with every wind of doctrine and tossed to and fro, like children, instead of that, 
speaking the truth in love, that we may grow up into Him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. That we will continue to grow no matter how hot the oven is, no matter how hot the furnace is, no matter how great the heat, no matter how great the pressure, that we will continue to grow in Him and we will magnify Him. Much verse 16. From whom the whole body, from Christ, the whole body, fitly joined together. Now listen, this verse is amazing. Christ has taken the church and He has placed you where He wants you. We are fitly joined together. We are we are, watch, watch this again. From whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies. Gathered. Every joint, every, every member works. And so we work together and, and we work together and we function as the body of Christ. Watch, let me read it all again. From whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies according to the effectual working in the measure of every part. See, we all have a responsibility. Make us increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. That's what's supposed to happen. We're to grow. That's the bottom line. Well, let me show you, uh, getting down towards the end, and I got an unneeded uh, window that came up there. But, uh, uh, Romans 8. Watch it. 28, 29. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are the call according to His purpose. For whom He did foreknow, He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of the Son. Now, let me just talk about something. Whenever He talks about predestination here, He's talking about the body of Christ, not individuals. And so what He's saying is that before the foundation of the world, God knew that He was going to have a bride for His Son, that He was going to have the body for His Son in the church. And so before the foundation of the world, He predestinated that anybody that would come and would, that would accept, would, would put their faith in Christ, whosoever will may come, whoever would accept that invitation, that they would be conformed into the image of His Son. Christ, so oh, that's what he wants for us. That's what he wants. John, John the Baptist put it so very well. In John 3.30, he said, He, Jesus, must increase, but I must decrease. That should be our goal. That should be one of our theme verses for life. That whenever I go through this life, that people see more of Jesus and less of me. That means that the flesh is going to have to be reckoned to be dead. Because the, the flesh wants all the attention. John said that's not the way it's to be. He, Jesus, must increase. And I must decrease. In closing, I want to read for you what Warren Wiersbe says, summing up all this section. And I quote, He says, Love is a circulatory system of the body. It has been discovered that isolated, unloved babies do not grow properly and are especially susceptible to disease, while babies who are loved and handled grow normally and are stronger. So it is with the children of God. An isolated Christian cannot minister to others, nor can others minister to him. And it is impossible for the gifts to be ministered either way. So then, spiritual unity is not something we manufacture. <laughs> it is something we already have in Christ. And we must protect and maintain it. Truth unites, but lies divide. Love unites, but selfishness divides. Therefore, speaking the truth in love, let us equip one another and edify one another that all of us may grow up to be more like Christ. Unquote. That's what we're supposed to do. That's the goal. That's God's goal for you and I that we are to grow in spiritual maturity, that we are to become more and more like Christ. Back to John's words, that Jesus must increase and I must decrease. So that whenever people see me, they see Him. They don't see me. That I become His representative. And, and that's what we are. We're ambassadors for Christ. We're His representatives. 
you represent him where you are, I represent him where I am, and with the people I contact and with the people you contact. I can't get them all, and neither can you. So we do our job, wherever it is that God has placed us. But let me get you back to the whole the whole focus of all of this. From this pulpit, the word of God has to be proclaimed all the time. It's got to be. Don't ever accept anything less. Don't accept entertainment. Don't, ex- don't accept stories. It's not going to do any good. What you need is the Word of God. You need that thought. You need the Bible. You need the Bible flooded into your mind because I guarantee you what that will do, that will equip you for what's coming on down the road. That will equip you. That will equip you to serve Him. That will, that will equip you to do your job a whole lot better, whatever your job is outside the walls of this building, wherever you go. If you end up in the hospital, that will equip you to be a better believer inside of that hospital because you're rooted and grounded in the truth of God's Word. That's what the church needs. That's the way God designed it. That's His blueprint. That's not mine. That's His. So let us never forget that. Let's pray together. Father, Father, we thank you for the verses that are here. <coughs> Lord, we thank you for what is laid out for us. Father, we thank you that as your word is taught, that we are strengthened. We grow. That we grow in maturity. The unity is strengthened. Father, that Christ is manifest more in our lives. Father, help us all to have a hunger and a desire to know more about your word. To draw closer and nearer to you. Lord, maybe there is a believer here today and, and they've just kind of lost that appetite. Lord, I'm reminded of in our physical lives that if we feed on junk food, Lord, we lose the appetite to stay in those things which are good for us. Lord, in our spiritual lives, if we feed on junk food, we will lose our appetite of your word. So if there's a believer here and, and Father, they've kind of lost the appetite for your word, might they just stop and examine their life today? Something's wrong. Because the Spirit of God within them desires the word. Somehow, some way, they have quenched the Spirit. They are hindering the Spirit. So for so Lord, help them to understand that, I pray. Father, increase all of our appetites for the truth of your word. Lord, we want to learn and teach us. Teach us. So, Lord, take the message today. Use it for your honor and for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Mr. Riggs, get it.